Well, Bronwyn, Nathan, thank you very much indeed for joining us on the programme. Now, Hagar has been in Afghanistan now for, for a few years. Just tell me a little bit about, about how that all started. Right, well, Hagar has worked in Cambodia and Vietnam for nearly 20 years in Cambodia. And it opened in Afghanistan because there is a need in the area of trafficking and in the area of women needing assistance. So what Hagar is about is to restore broken lives. We accept the most tough conditions and we um, help people through recovery, um, into rehabilitation and employment and into society again. You said it really quickly like that, it sounds easy, but I guess it's not nowhere near as easy as that. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not that easy. Um, in Afghanistan, there are lots of challenges um, and we have a transitional care centre for women and girls who have left their homes because of violence and who can never return home because if they do return home, um, they'll probably be killed by their families. Why is it that, that violence is, is such an issue? Is that a function of, of being a, a Muslim society or is it a, a function of Afghanistan's past because it's, it is a place that everyone seems to be fighting over for donkey years? Yeah, I think it is multifactorial. I think the fact that um, it has been in the crossroads and that multiple people have tried to conquer it over the years makes Afghan men extremely protective of their women. Um, they, in Pashtun culture, they have three treasures, gold, land and women. So all of which are to be kept at home and kept um, protected because they are treasured. Mm. As a family, you're out there with, with your kids. You know, where, how does that come about? I mean, how do you explain to the rest of your family, oh, we're going to go and live in war-torn Afghanistan for a few years with our kids? Yeah, <laughs> um, it, it is very difficult. And, and you do get the comments that we're irresponsible taking our children to a place like Afghanistan. But there are actually children living in Afghanistan um, uh, and have done so for, for many years. Um, yeah, we, we, we took it seriously. We, we actually travelled there when um, uh, our eldest, Zara, um, was one, so, and now she's 10. So um, they've lived their lives there. I think our families have come to grips with the idea <laughs> that we uh, have been there for a wee while now, and um, we, we, um, we love it there. Do you, that's the funny thing. I mean, I've, I've spoken to lots of people who've worked in Afghanistan, and you see the pictures on TV and, you know, it looks dusty and deserty and people don't seem to smile and it all looks very serious. And yet, almost without fail, everyone I've ever spoken to says, I love it. I love the people. I love the place. And you two are the same. <laughs> we were talking before. And that's exactly what you two said. So what is it about the place that's so special? It is a hard, it's a harsh place to live. Um, you know, you do appreciate the greens that actually are more beige than, than green. Um, but um, you do, it's, it's such a rugged beauty. And I think you see that in the lives of Afghans as well. Um, their, their lives have been tough. And with that, um, there is an intensity of, of life that um, we get to enjoy and they share with us. Um, they're incredibly hospitable. And um, yeah, we could learn a lot from their hospitality. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's talk a little bit about what, what, how Hagar actually works. So, so you find women who find themselves in danger. To start with, how do you, how do you find them or do they find you? Uh, so, yes, yeah, some of each. Um, sometimes we hear about people just through word of mouth, people who know us personally, people who know our staff. Um, other times they get referred by the police or by the Ministry of Women's Affairs. Afghan Independent Human Rights, there's a number of ways, for, and from other shelters. Because we have a view of transitional care, which will help people get into employment, we do get referrals from other shelters who are really safe houses in that their clients aren't allowed out, they're not allowed to go to work, they're not allowed to have a telephone, they're very much like prison. So mm. some of the clients who, who are in danger if they go home, but aren't in danger if they just stay away from their families, they are more suited to come into our programs. So you're trying to, to bring them to a position where they can, they can live independently? Yes. Is that allowed? Um, it's <laughs> not common in Afghan culture. It is a little bit on the edge of Afghan culture. But with all the years of war, there have been groups of widows who simply now have no male relatives. Mm. 
And so they have formed little communities where women live together. And that's the model we're using for our women getting back into society. It's interesting because it sounds very much like the authorities are quite supportive of what you do. They're obviously, they're, if they're referring people to you, you must be doing something right. Yeah, we have good relations with the government and the ministries um, involved. Uh, yeah, uh, and, and we want to keep it that way. <laughs> <laughs> is, I mean, is that hard, working with, with, with the government? Because we hear, again, from the media, we hear stories that, that the government is, is corrupt, that it's bureaucratic, that it's hard to work with, that the goalposts change on a minute-by-minute -minute basis. Does that make it hard for you? Um, it does make it um, challenging. We do spend a lot of time working with the government. We also have a capacity building program for trafficking in persons and that is involving a number of different ministries. But it's actually because we have those sort of regular contacts with people that allow us to develop the relationships we need to get our programs done. Let's take a quick break and we'll come back and chat some more. Welcome back to Ends and Focus, our guest on the programme from the Hagar organisation, Nathan and Bronwyn. Uh, during the break, we were talking a little bit about, about what it's like for, for women in Afghanistan. How hard is it to be a single woman, a, a, effectively a woman without a family in Afghanistan? Yeah, women are seen as part of families and it is very difficult for women to operate um, life without family. For instance, you cannot travel as a woman on your own. You, there are lots of police checkpoints in Afghanistan and you'll be stopped at the edge of your town um, and asked why, where is your male relative and sent home or arrested for being on your own. Um, so it is a very, very difficult um, task for women. Um, but those who can financially sustain their families are in a much better place to challenge that part of Afghan society. So it's all about, it's actually, it's actually quite pragmatic in the end. <laughs> well it is, but there is a cultural, we also need men in the community who will support mm. um, women who are un, um, in poor situations and don't have male relatives and who'll be supportive and, and assist them to be in society. What, one of our hopes is, is that while um, our um, clients go through that recovery stage, that um, they'd be able to gain employment um, through um, our, our projects and, and, um, and in, in doing so um, in the long term um, find themselves in perhaps group homes where they're supported by other women um, and perhaps um, a, a, an older couple. Or, um, mm. yeah. when, it's, when it's so ingrained in the, in the culture, I mean, what do they make of you two? Because I mean, you're you actually as the officially the boss, but you I mean just just meeting you now, you you obviously work work very much as as equals. There isn't that sense of of Bronwyn being your chattel. No, <laughs> no, no she's not. <laughs> not at all. <laughs> I, I, what do they what do they make of, a, of of your very Western relationship? I think a lot of people um, look on us as as an example, um, actually. Um, we are very respectful of uh, the Islamic culture and um, the culture we're within. Um, we, we both speak Pashto and, and uh, um, we, we've, yeah, again, dress accordingly. Um, and, yeah, ultimately, I think s often um, relationships um, and marriage relationships in Afghanistan are not necessarily um, equal. Um, the male is often well-educated, the female not so much. Um, you know, and, and there are rare cases that it's not like that, but I think sometimes they think, oh, wouldn't it be nice um, to be a bit more... Um yeah, that's what we hope. And, um, you know, I don't have any problems working with my male colleagues. They mm. know that this is my position and they respect that and work well with me. Mm. I know that Hagar doesn't just work with, with women, though. You, you, you deal with, with men who find themselves in trouble as well. Tell us a bit about that. Um, we work with women and children as our, um, but that includes boys. Yeah. Um, and in Afghanistan there is a culture of the abuse of boys. There is a proverb that says women are for children and boys are for pleasure. And there is a lot of culturally accepted abuse of boys mm. that is damaging to those individuals. And we want to start a project 
specifically looking for boys. How do you, how do you cope with that ingrained cultural position? I mean, that must be because effectively what you're saying to people is what your society is doing is wrong rather than what you are doing is wrong. It's, it's actually bigger than that. Is that? It's, it's an unspoken um, activity. Uh, no one really talks about it, but it's, it's in some ways condoned. Mm. Um, you know, some, some women, uh, some men have, have a wife and, and a boy. Um, and um, yeah, I, I think there are many areas of culture, and it doesn't matter where you live, um, that needs to change. Um, uh, this is one where we see it quite clearly, and I think um, slowly, slowly, as, as examples are shown, and people start standing up and saying, actually, this is not a good practice, um, then society does change. And so, you know, we can certainly encourage that uh, with the work we do. Mm. How are New Zealanders viewed in Afghanistan? Because are they seen along with, with the American and, and the British troops as, as part of that sort of Western... I guess almost invaders or I mean, what, what's that? I mean for some, for some people that is certainly the case that any foreign soldier is seen as an invader. Does that make it difficult for the work that you do? Um, I think all of the work we do is culturally challenging yeah. and so I don't think it adds very much to the cultural challenge of what we do. Um, having said that, I think that the New Zealand troops that are in Bamiyan are extremely well received. Nathan's visited Bamiyan and talked to the people and they're all extremely receptive to the work that the New Zealand soldiers have been doing. I think they regard them as more personable. Um, mm. Although, and, and the work that they've done um, so far is transformational. So, um, and they work with um, other organisations, making sure that no one's redoing um, and repeating things. Um, so, you know, the dollar gets stretched significantly and, um, yeah, ultimately lives are, are being changed. When you hear, though, of violence such as has happened, you hear the Taliban are involved. In the West, that gets reported as the Taliban are the bad guys, they're shooting the good guys. It, it's very black and white. But from what you're saying, that actually isn't, it's not as clear cut as that. It's definitely not as clear cut as that. The, the Taliban are not one uniform group. Um, I've met Talibs who are proudly Talib, but who are looking out for their communities, want our help, helping the community to develop. Um, so totally not part of mm. the Western media mindset of bad guys. Um, and it is just a much more complex um, situation mm. than is portrayed. Does that make it hard to explain to people back here what it's like? I think, I think some people are, are able to and are interested in, in, in more, but um, ultimately we, we try to keep it simple. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it is, it is difficult. Um, and I think we just have to be patient. We're all on a learning curve wherever we are. So what's the future for Hagar? Uh, Hagar is in Afghanistan for the long term. Um, we know that it's a long journey with the Afghan people and we're committed to staying there um, as an organisation um, for many years to come. We've been in um, Cambodia for 18 years. That would be the plan for Hagar Afghanistan as well. Um, there's a long way to go. Well, thank you very much indeed for, for sparing time for us today. But I think we all take our hats off to you. Thank you. Thank you.